Everything, Everything by Nicola Yoon. To my husband, David Yoon, who showed me my heart, and to my smart, beautiful daughter, Penny, who made it bigger. Here's my secret. It's quite simple. One sees clearly only with the heart. Anything essential is invisible to the eyes. The Little Prince. The White Room. I've read many more books than you. It doesn't matter how many you've read, I've read more. Believe me, I've had the time. In my white room, against my white walls, on my glistening white bookshelves, book spines provide the only color. The books are all brand new hardcovers, no Jeremy's secondhand soft covers for me. They come to me from outside, decontaminated and vacuum sealed in plastic wrap. I would like to see the machine that does this. I imagine each book traveling on a white conveyor belt towards rectangular white stations where robotic white arms dust, scrape, spray, and otherwise sterilize it until it's finally deemed clean enough to come to me. When a new book arrives, my first task is to remove the wrapping, a process that involves scissors and more than one broken nail. My second task is to write my name on the inside front cover. Property of Madeline Whittier. I don't know why I do this. There's no one else here except my mother, who never reads, and my nurse Carla, who has no time to read because she spends all her time watching me breathe. I rarely have visitors, and so there's no one to lend my books to. There's no one who needs reminding that the forgotten book on his or her shelf belongs to me. Reward if found. Check all that apply. This is the section that takes me the longest time, and I vary it with each book. Sometimes the rewards are fanciful. Picnic with me, Madeline, in a pollen-filled field of poppies, lilies, and endless man-in-the-moon marigolds under a clear blue summer sky. Or, drink tea with me, Madeline, in a lighthouse in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in the middle of a hurricane. Or, Snorkel with me, Madeline, off Molokini to spot the Hawaiian state fish. Sometimes the rewards are not so fanciful. A visit with me, Madeline, to a used bookstore. Or a walk outside with me, Madeline, just down the block and back. Or a short conversation with me, Madeline, discussing anything you want on my white couch in my white bedroom. Sometimes the reward is just me. Madeline. Sid Rowe. My disease is as rare as it is famous. It's a form of severe combined immune deficiency, but you know it as bubble baby disease. Basically, I'm allergic to the world. Anything can trigger a bout of sickness. It could be the chemicals in the cleaner used to wipe the table that I just touched. It could be someone's perfume. It could be the toxic spice in the food I just ate. It could be one or all or none of these things or something else entirely. No one knows the triggers, but everyone knows the consequences. According to my mom, I almost died as an infant. And so I stay on sit row. I don't leave my house, have not left my house in 17 years. Daily Health Log. Patient name, Madeline Whittier. Date, May 2nd. Caretaker, Dr. Pauline Whittier. Breaths per minute, consistent at 10 from 8 to 2. Room temperature, consistent at about 72 from 8 to 2 p.m. Ale filter status, okay from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Birthday wish. Movie night or honor pictionary or book club, my mom asks while inflating a blood pressure cuff around my arm. She doesn't mention her favorite of all, our post-dinner activities, phonetic scrabble. I look up to see that her eyes are already laughing at me. Phonetic, I say. She stops inflating the cuff. 
Ordinarily, Carla, my full-time nurse, would be taking my blood pressure and filling out my daily health log, but my mom's given her the day off. It's my birthday, and we always spend the day together, just the two of us. She puts on her stethoscope so that she can listen to my heartbeat. Her smile fades and is replaced by her more serious doctor's face. This is the face her patients most often see, slightly distant, professional, and concerned. I wonder if they find it comforting. Impulsively, I give her a quick kiss on the forehead to remind her that it's just me, her favorite patient, her daughter. She opens her eyes, smiles, and caresses my cheek. I guess if you're going to be born with an illness that requires constant care, then it's good to have your mom as your doctor. A few seconds later, she gives me her best, I'm the doctor, and I'm afraid I have some bad news for you face. It's your B-Day. Why don't we play something you have an actual chance of winning? Honor Pictionary? Since regular Pictionary can't really be played with two people, we invented Honor Pictionary. One person draws and the other person is on her honor to make her best guess. If you guess correctly, the other person scores. I narrow my eyes at her. We're playing phonetic and I'm winning this time, I say confidently though I have no chance of winning. In all our years of playing phonetic Scrabble, or phonetic Scrabble, I've never beaten her at it. The last time we played, I came close, but then she devastated me on the final word playing J-E-E-N-Z on a triple word score. Okay, she shakes her head with mock pity. Anything you want. She closes her laughing eyes to listen to the stethoscope. We spend the rest of the morning baking my traditional birthday cake, a vanilla sponge with vanilla cream frosting. After it's cooled, I apply an unreasonably thin layer of frosting, just enough to cover the cake. We are, both of us, cake people, not frosting people. For decoration, I draw 18 frosted daisies with white petals and a white center across the top. On the sides, I fashion draped white curtains. Perfect. My mom peers over my shoulders as I finish up, just like you. I turn to face her. She's smiling wide, proud smile at me, but her eyes are bright with tears. You are tragic, I say, and squirt a dollop of frosting on her nose, which only makes her laugh and cry some more. Really, she's not usually this emotional, but something about my birthday always makes her both weepy and joyful at the same time. And if she's weepy and joyful, then I'm weepy and joyful too. I know, she says, throwing her hands helplessly up in the air. I'm totally pathetic. She pulls me into a hug and squeezes frosting, gets into her hair. My birthday is the one day of the year that we're both most acutely aware of my illness. It's the acknowledging of the passage of time that does it. Another whole year of being sick. No hope for a cure on the horizon. Another year of missing all the normal teenagery things. Learner's permit, first kiss, prom, first heartbreak, first fender bender. Another year of my mom doing nothing but working and taking care of me. Every other day, these omissions are easy. Easier, at least, to ignore. This year is a little harder than the previous. Maybe it's because I'm 18 now. Technically, I'm an adult. I should be leaving home, going off to college... My mom should be dreading an empty nest syndrome, but because of Sid, I'm not going anywhere. Later, after dinner, she gives me a beautiful set of watercolor pencils that had been on my wish list for months. We go into the living room and sit cross-legged in front of the coffee table. This is also part of our birthday ritual. She lights a single candle in the center of the cake. I close my eyes and make a wish. I blow the candle out. What did you wish for? She asks as soon as I open my eyes. Really, there's only one thing to wish for, a magical cure that will allow me to run free outside like a wild animal, but I never make that wish because it's impossible. It's like wishing that mermaids and dragons and unicorns were real. Instead, I wish for something more likely than a cure, something less likely to make us both sad. World peace, I say. Three slices of cake later, we begin a game of phonetic. I do not win. I don't even come close. She uses all seven words and puts down P-O-K-A-L-I-P next to an S. Pocalypse. What's that? 
I ask. Apocalypse, she says, eyes dancing. No, Mom, no way. I cannot give that to you. Yes, is all she says. Mom, you need an extra A. No way. Apocalypse, she says for effect, gesturing at the letters. It totally works. I shake my head. P-O-K-A-L-I-P-S, she insists, slowly dragging out the word. Oh my God, you're relentless, I say, throwing my hands up. Okay, okay, I'll allow it. Yes. She pumps her fists and laughs at me and marks down her now insurmountable score. You never really understood this game, she says. It's a game of persuasion. I slice myself another piece of cake. That was not persuasion, I say. That was cheating. Same, same, she says, and we both laugh. You can beat me at Honor Pictionary tomorrow, she says. After I lose, we go to the couch and watch our favorite movie, Young Frankenstein. Watching it is also part of our birthday ritual. I put my head in her lap, and she strokes my hair, and we laugh at the same jokes in the same way that we've been laughing at them for years. All in all, not a bad way to spend your 18th birthday. Stays the same. I'm reading on my white couch when Carla comes in the next morning. Feliz cumpleaños, she sings out. I lower my book. Gracias. How was the birthday? She begins unpacking her medical bag. We had fun. Vanilla cake and vanilla frosting, she asks. Of course. Young Frankenstein? Yes. And you lost at that game, she asks. We're pretty much predictable, huh? Don't mind me, she says laughing. I'm just jealous of how sweet you and your mama are. She picks up my health log from yesterday, quickly reviews my mom's measurements, and adds a new sheet to the clipboard. These days, Rosa can't even be bothered to give me the time of day. Rosa is Carla's 17-year-old daughter. According to Carla, they were really close until hormones and boys took over. I can't imagine that happening to my mom and me. Carla sits next to me on the couch, and I hold out my hand for the blood pressure cuff. Her eyes drop to my book. Flowers of Aldernon again? She asks. Doesn't that book make you cry? One day it won't, I say. I want to be sure to be reading it on that day. She rolls her eyes at me and takes my hand. It is kind of a flip answer, but then I wonder if it's true. Maybe I'm holding out hope that one day, some day, things will change. Life is short. Spoiler reviews by Madeline. Flowers of Aldernon by Daniel Keyes. Spoiler alert. Aldernon is a mouse. The mouse dies. Alien Invasion Part 2 I'm up to the part where Charlie realizes that the mouse's fate may be his own when I hear a loud rumbling noise outside. Immediately, my mind goes to outer space. I picture a giant mothership hovering in the skies above us. The house trembles and my books vibrate on the shelves. A steady beeping joins the rumbling, and I know what it is. A truck. Probably just lost, I tell myself, to stave off disappointment. Probably just made a wrong turn on their way to someplace else. But then the engine cuts off. Doors open and close. A moment passes and then another. And then a woman's voice sings out. Welcome to our new home, everybody. Carla stares at me for a hard few seconds. I know what she's thinking. It's happening again. Madeline's Diary, August 5th. The family in the house next door moved away. The boy cried. He hid in the garden and ate dirt until his mom found him, but she didn't yell at him for eating it like she usually does. Outside is so quiet now. Last night, I had a dream that they didn't really move away. They got kidnapped by aliens. The aliens didn't take me because I'm sick and they only wanted healthy people. They took mommy and Carla away and the family next door, and I was all alone. I woke up crying and mommy came and stayed in bed with me. I didn't tell her what the dream was about because it would make her sad. But I told Carla, and she gave me a hug. The Welcome Committee. Carla, I say, it won't be like last time. I'm not eight years old anymore. I want you to promise, she begins, but I are already at the window, sweeping the curtains aside. 
I am not prepared for the bright California sun. I'm not prepared for the sight of it, high and blazing hot and white against the washed out white sky. I am blind. But then the white haze over my vision begins to clear. Everything is haloed. I see the truck and the silhouette of an older woman twirling, the mother. I see an older man at the back of the truck, the father. I see a girl maybe a little younger than me, the daughter. Then I see him. He's tall, lean, and wearing all black. Black t-shirt, black jeans, black sneakers, and a black knit cap that covers his hair completely. He's white with a pale honey tan, and his face is starkly angular. He jumps down from his perch on the back of the truck and glides across the driveway, moving as if gravity affects him differently than it does the rest of us. He stops, cocks his head to one side, and stares up at his new house as if it were a puzzle. After a few seconds, he begins bouncing lightly on the balls of his feet. Suddenly, he takes off at a sprint and runs literally six feet up the wall. He grabs a windowsill and dangles from it for a second or two and then drops back down into a crouch. Nice, Allie, says his mother. Didn't I tell you to quit doing that stuff? His father growls. He ignores them both and remains in his crouch. I press my open palm against the glass, breathless as if I'd done that crazy stunt myself. I look from him to the wall to the windowsill and back to him again. He's no longer crouched. He's staring up at me. Our eyes meet. Vaguely, I wonder what he sees in my window. Strange girl in white with wide staring eyes. He grins at me and his face is no longer stark, no longer severe. I try to smile back, but I'm so flustered that I frown at him instead. My white balloon. That night, I dream that the house breathes with me. I exhale and the walls contract with pin-pricked balloon, crushing me as it deflates. I inhale and the walls expand. A single breath more and my life will finally, finally explode. Neighborhood Watch. His mom's schedule. 6.35 a.m. Arrives on porch with a steaming cup of something hot. Coffee? 6.36 a.m. Stares off into empty lot across the way while sipping her drink. Tea? 7 a.m. Re-enters the house. 7.15 a.m. Back on porch. Kisses husband goodbye. Watches as his car drives away. 9.30 a.m. Gardens. Looks for, finds, and discards cigarette butts. 1 p.m. Leaves house and car. Errands? 5 p.m. Pleads with Kara and Ollie to begin chores before your father gets home. Kara's sister schedule. 10 a.m. Stomps outside wearing black boots and a fuzzy brown bathrobe. 10.01 a.m. Check cell phone messages. She gets a lot of messages. 10.06 a.m. Smokes three cigarettes in the garden between our two houses. 10.20 a.m. Digs a hole with the toe of her boots and buries cigarette carcasses. 10.25 a.m. to 5 p.m. Texts or talks on the phone. 5.25 p.m. Chores. His dad's schedule. 7.15 a.m. Leaves for work. 6 p.m. Arrives home from work. 6.20 p.m. Sits on porch with drink number one. 6.30 p.m. Re-enters the house for dinner. 7 p.m. Back on porch with drink number two. 7.25 p.m. Drink number three. 7.45 p.m. Yelling at family begins. 10.35 p.m. Yelling at family subsides. Ollie's schedule. Unpredictable. I spy. His family calls him Ollie. Well, his sister and his mom call him Ollie. His dad calls him Oliver. He's the one I watch the most. His bedroom is on the second floor and almost directly across from mine, and his blinds are almost always open. Some morning he sleeps in until noon. Others, he's gone from his room before I wake to begin my surveillance. Most mornings, though, he wakes at 9 a.m., climbs out of his bedroom, and makes his way, Spider-Man style, to the roof using the siding. He stays up there for about an hour before swinging, legs first, back into his room. No matter how much I try, I haven't been able to see what he does when he's up there. His room is empty before a bed and a chest of drawers. A few boxes from the move remain unpacked and stacked by the doorway. 
There are no decorations except for a single poster for a movie called Jump London. I looked it up and it's about parkour, which is kind of street gymnastics, which explains how he's able to do all that crazy stuff that he does. The more I watch, the more I want to know. I've just sat down at the dining table for dinner. My mom places a cloth napkin in my lap and fills my water glass and then Carla's. Friday night dinners are special in my house. Carla even stays late to eat with us instead of with her own family. Everything at Friday night dinner is French. The napkins are white cloth embroidered with fleur de lis at the edges. The cutlery is antique French and ornate. We even have miniature silver La Tour Eiffel salt and pepper shakers. Of course, we have to be careful with the menu because of my allergies, but my mom always makes her version of cassoulette, a French stew with chicken, sausage, duck, and white beans. It was my dad's favorite dish before he died. The version that my mom cooks for me contains only white beans cooked in chicken broth. Madeline, my mom says, Mr. Waterman tells me that you're late on your architecture assignment. Is everything all right, baby girl? I'm surprised by her question. I know I'm late, but since I've never been late before, I guess I didn't realize that she was keeping track. Is the assignment too hard? She frowns as she ladles Castellette into my bowl. Do you want me to find you a new tutor? Oui. Non et non, I say in response to each question. Everything's fine. I'll turn it in tomorrow, I promise. I just lost track of time. She nods and begins slicing and buttering pieces of crusty French bread for me. I know she wants to ask something else. I even know what she wants to ask, but she's afraid to answer. Is it the new neighbors? Carla gives me a sharp look. I've never lied to my mom. I've never had a reason, and I don't think I know how to. But something tells me what I need to do. I've just been reading too much. You know how I get with a new book. I make my voice as reassuring as possible. I don't want her to worry. She has enough to worry about with me as it is. How do you say liar in French? Not hungry? My mom asks a few minutes later. She presses the back of her hand against my forehead. You don't have a fever. She lets her hand linger a moment longer. I'm about to reassure her when the doorbell rings. This happens so infrequently that I don't know what to make of it. The doorbell rings again. My mom half rises from her chair. Carla stands all the way up. The bell sounds for a third time. I smile for no reason. Want me to get it, ma'am? Carla asks. My mom waves her off. Stay here, she says to me. Carla moves to stand behind me, her hands pressing down lightly on my shoulder. I know I should stay here. I know I'm expected to. Certainly I expect me to. But somehow, today, I just can't. I need to know who it is, even if it's just a wayward traveler. Carla touches my upper arm. Your mother said to stay here. But why? She's just being extra cautious. Besides, she won't let anyone pass the airlock. She relents, and I'm off down the hallway with her right behind me. The airlock is a small sealed room surrounding the front door. It's airtight so that no potential hazards can leak into the main house when the front door is open. I press my ear against it. At first, I can't hear anything over the air filters, but then I hear a voice. My mom sent a bunt. The voice is deep and smooth and definitely amused. My brain is processing the word bunt, trying to get an image of what it looks like before it dawns on me just who is at the door. Ollie. The thing about my mom's bunts is that they are not very good. Terrible. Actually inedible. Very nearly indestructible between you and me. A new voice now. A girl's. His sister? Every time we move, she makes us bring one to the neighbor. Oh. Well, this is a surprise, isn't it? That's very nice. Please tell her thank you very much for me. There's no chance that this bunt cake has passed the proper inspections, and I can feel my mom trying to figure out how to tell them she can't take the cake without revealing the truth about me. I'm sorry, but I can't accept this. There's a moment of shocked silence. So you want us to take it back? back? Ali asked disbelievingly. Well, that's rude, Kara says. 
She sounds angry and resigned, as though she'd expected disappointment. I'm sorry, my mom says again. It's complicated. I'm really very sorry, because this is so sweet of you and your mom. Please thank her for me. Is your daughter home? Ollie asks quite loudly before she can close the door. We're hoping she could come show us around. My heart speeds up, and I can feel the pulse of it against my ribs. Did he just ask about me? No stranger has just dropped by to visit me before, aside from my mom, Carla, and my tutors. The world barely knows I exist. I mean, I exist online. I have online friends and my Tumblr book reviews. But that's not the same as being a real person who can be visited by strange boys bearing bunt cakes. I'm so sorry, but she can't. Welcome to the neighborhood, and thank you again. The front door closes, and I step back to wait for my mom. She has to remain in the airlock until the filters have a chance to purify the foreign air. A minute later, she steps back into the house. She doesn't notice me right away. Instead, she stands still, eyes closed with her head slightly bowed. I'm sorry, she says without looking up. It's okay, Mom. Don't worry. For the thousandth time, I realize anew how hard my disease is on her. It's the only world I've known. But before me, she had my brother and my dad. She traveled and played soccer. She had a normal life that did not include being cloistered in a bubble for 14 hours a day with her sick teenage daughter. I hold her and let her hold me for a few more minutes. She's taking this disappointment much harder than I am. I'll make it up to you, she says. There's nothing to make up for. I love you, sweetie. We drift back into the dining room and finish dinner quickly, and for the most part, silently. Carla leaves and my mom asks if I want to beat her at a game of honor Pictionary, but I ask for a rain check. I'm not really in the mood. Instead, I head upstairs, imagining what a bunt cake tastes like. P.S. Day Rejection Back in my room, I go immediately to my bedroom window. His dad is home from work, and something's wrong because he's angry and getting angrier by the second. He grabs the bunt cake from Kara and throws it hard at Ollie, but Ollie's too fast, too graceful. He dodges, and the cake falls to the ground. Remarkably, the bunt seems unharmed, but the plate shatters against the driveway. This only makes his dad angrier. You clean that up! You clean that up right now! He slams into the house. His mom goes after him. Kara shakes her head at Ollie and says something to him that makes his shoulders slump. Ollie stands there looking at the cake for a few minutes. He disappears into the house and returns with a boom and a dustpan. He takes his time, way longer than necessary, sweeping up the broken plate. When he's done, he climbs to the roof, taking the bunt with him, and it's another hour before he swings back into his room. I'm hiding in my usual spot behind the curtain when I suddenly no longer want to hide. I turn on the lights and go back to the window. I don't even bother to take a deep breath. It's not going to help. I pull the curtain aside to find that he's already there in his window, staring right at me. He doesn't smile. He doesn't wave. Instead, he reaches his arm overhead and pulls the blind closed. Survival. How long are you going to mob around the house? Carla asks. You've been like this all week. I'm not moping, I say, though I've been moping a little. Ollie's rejection has made me feel like a little girl again. It reminded me of why I stopped paying attention to the world before. But trying to get back to my normal routine is hard when I can hear all the sounds of the outside world. I notice things that I paid very little attention to before. I hear the wind disturbing the trees. I hear birds gossiping in the mornings. I see the rectangles of sunlight that slip through my blinds and work their way across the room throughout the day. You can mark time by them. As much as I'm trying to keep the world out, it seems determined to come in. You have been reading the same five pages in that book for days now. She nods at my copy of Lord of the Flies. Well, it's a terrible book. I thought it was a classic. It's terrible. Most of the boys are awful, and all they talk about is hunting and killing pigs. I've never been so hungry for bacon in my life. She laughs, but it's half-hearted at best. She sits on the couch next to me and moves my legs into her lap. Tell me, she says. I put the book down and close my eyes. I just want them to go away, I confess. It was easier before. 
What was easier? I don't know. Being me? Being sick? She squeezes my leg. You listen to me now. You're the strongest, bravest person I know. You better believe that. Carlo, you don't have to. Shush. Listen to me. I've been thinking this over. I could see this new thing was weighing down on you, but I know you're going to be all right. I'm not sure. That's okay. I can be sure for both of us. We've been together in this house for 15 years, so I know what I'm talking about. When I first started with you, I thought it was only a matter of time before depression would take you over. And there was that one summer when it came close, but it didn't happen. Every day you get up and learn something new. Every day you find something to be happy about. Every single day you have a smile for me. You worry about your mother than, more than you do about yourself. I don't think Carla has ever said this many words all at once. My own Rosa, she continues, but then stops. She leans back and closes her eyes in the grip of some emotion I don't understand. My Rosa could learn a thing or two from you. She has everything I could give her, but she thinks she has nothing. I smile. Carla complains about her daughter, but I can tell she spoils her as much as she can. She opens her eyes, and whatever was bothering her passes. You see? There's that smile again. She pats my leg. Life is hard, honey. Everything finds a way. Life is Short. Spoiler Reviews by Madeline. Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Spoiler alert. Boys are savages. First Contact. Two days pass, and I've stopped moping. I'm getting better at ignoring the neighbors when I hear a ping coming from outside. I'm on my couch, still mired in Lord of the Flies. Mercifully, I'm close to finishing. Ralph is on the beach, awaiting a violent death. I'm so eager for the book to end so that I can read something else, something happier, that I ignore the sound. A few minutes later, there's another ping. Louder this time. I put the book down and listen. Pings three, four, and five come in rapid succession. Something's hitting my window. Hail? I'm up and at my window before I can think better of it. I push the curtains aside. Ollie's window is wide open. The blinds are up and the lights are off in his room. The indestructible bunt is sitting on his windowsill, wearing googly eyes that are staring right at me. The cake trembles and then tilts forward as if contemplating the distance to the ground. It retreats and trembles some more. I'm trying to see Ollie in his darkened room when the bunt leaps from the sill and plunges to the ground. I gasp. Did the cake just commit suicide? I crane my neck to see what's become of it, but it's too dark out. Just then, a spotlight illuminates the cake. Unbelievably, it's still intact. What is that thing made of? It's probably best that we didn't try to eat it. The light goes out, and I look up just in time to catch Ollie's black-clad hand and flashlight retreat into the window. I stay for a few minutes, watching and waiting for him to come back, but he doesn't. Night 2. I'm just settling into bed when the pings begin again. I'm determined to ignore him, and I do. Whatever he wants, I can't do. It's easier not to know. I don't go to the window that night or the next. Night four. I can't stand it. I peek out from the corner of my curtains. The bunt is sitting on the sill. Band-aids and bandages covering half its body. Ollie is nowhere to be found. Night five. The bunt is sitting on a table next to the window. There's a martini glass filled with green liquid, a pack of cigarettes, and a pill bottle with a skull and crossbones label. Another suicide attempt? Still no Ollie. Night six. The bunt is lying on a white sheet. An upside-down plastic water bottle is attached to what looks like a coat hanger and is hanging above the cake. A string hangs from the bottle to the bunt like an IV. Ollie appears wearing a white jacket and stethoscope. He's frowning down at the bunt and listening for a heartbeat. I want to laugh, but I don't let myself. Ollie looks up and shakes his head solemnly. I close my curtains, suppressing a smile, and walk away. Night 7 I tell myself that I won't look, but as soon as the first ping sounds, I'm at the window. Ollie is wearing a black bathrobe with an oversized silver cross around his neck. He's performing last rites of the bunt. Finally, I cannot help it. I laugh and laugh and laugh. He looks up and grins back. 
He takes a black marker from his pocket and writes on the window. Backwards. Sorry about the other night. G-E-N-E-R-I-C-U-S-E-R-033 at gmail.com First Contact, Part 2 From Madeline F. Whittier to Generic User 003 at gmail.com Subject, Hello Sent, June 4th, 8.03 p.m. Hello, I guess we should start with introductions. My name is Madeline Whittier, but you can tell that from my email address. What's yours? From Madeline Whittier. P.S. You don't have anything to apologize for. P.P.S. What is that bunt made of? From Generic User 003. To Madeline F. Whittier. Subject, R.E. Hello. Sent, June 4th, 8.07 p.m. You are a terrible spy, Madeline Whittier. If you haven't already figured out my name, my sister and I tried to meet you last week, but your mom wasn't having it. I really don't know what the bun is made of. Rocks? From Madeline F. Whittier to generic user 003 at gmail.com. Subject, re, re, hello. Sent, June 4th, 8.11 p.m. Hi. Bunt cake recipe. Three cups all-purpose cement mix. One and a quarter cups fine grain sawdust. One cup gravel, various sizes for added interest. Half a teaspoon of salt, one cup of Elmer's glue, two sticks unsalted butter, three teaspoons paint thinner, four large eggs, room temperature. Directions. Preheat oven to 350 degrees, grease bunt pan. For the cake, one, in medium bowl, whisk together cement mix, salt, and gravel. Two, in large bowl, whisk together butter, Elmer's glue, paint thinner, and eggs. Do not overmix. 3. Gradually whisk in dry ingredients in small batches. 4. Spoon batter into bunt mold. 5. Bake until a tester inserted in cake refuses to come out. Cool in pan on rack. For the glaze, whisk together saw dust and enough water to form a thick yet pourable glaze. 2. Set rack with cake over a piece of wax paper for easy cleanup. 3. Drizzle cake with glaze and let solidify before serving. Serves 0. Madeline Whittier. P.S. I'm not a spy. First Contact Part 3. Wednesday, 8.15 p.m. Ollie. I was going to email you back, but saw you were online. Your recipe cracked me up. Has there ever been a spy in the whole history of spying that's admitted to being a spy? I think not. I'm Ollie, and it's nice to meet you. Ollie. What's the F stand for? Madeline. Furukawa. My mom is third generation Japanese American. I'm half Japanese. Ollie. What's the other half? Madeline. African American. Ollie. Do you have a nickname, Madeline, for a Whittier, or am I expected to call you Madeline F Furukawa Whittier? Madeline. I don't have a nickname. Everyone calls me Madeline. Sometimes my mom calls me Honey or Sweetie. Does that count? Ollie. No, of course it doesn't count. No one calls you M or Maddie or Mad or Maddie Mad Mad Mad. I'll pick one for you. Ollie, we're going to be friends. Thursday, 8.19 p.m. Madeline, since we're going to be friends, I have questions. Where are you from? Why do you wear a cap all the time? Is your head oddly shaped? Why do you only ever wear black? Related question. Are you aware that clothing comes in other colors? I have suggestions if you need them. What do you do on the roof? What's the tattoo on your right arm? Ollie. I have questions. We're from all over, but mostly the East Coast. I shaved my head before we moved here. Big mistake. Yes. I'm dead sexy in black. Yes. None needed. Thanks. Nothing. Barcode. Madeline. What have you got against capital letters and proper punctuation? Ollie. Who says that I do? Madeline. I have to go. Sorry. Friday, 8.34 p.m. Ollie. So how grounded are you? Madeline. I'm not grounded. Why do you think I'm grounded? Ollie. Well, something made you log off in a hurry last night. I'm guessing it was your mom. Trust me, I know all about being grounded. And you never leave the house. I haven't seen you outside once since we got here. Madeline. I'm sorry. 
I don't know what to say. I'm not grounded, but I can't leave the house. Ollie. Very mysterious. Are you a ghost? That's what I thought the day we moved in, and I saw you at the window. And it would be my luck that the pretty girl next door is not actually alive. Madeline. First I was a spy, now I'm a ghost? Ollie. Not a ghost? A fairy tale princess, then. Which one are you? Cinderella. Will you turn into a pumpkin if you leave the house? Ollie. Or Rapunzel. Your hair is pretty long. Just let it down, and I'll climb up and rescue you. Madeline. That has always sounded impractical and painful, don't you think? Ollie. Yes. So not Cinderella and not Rapunzel. Snow White, then? Your evil stepmom put you under a spell so that you can't leave the house and the world will never know how far you, you are? Madeline. That's not how the story goes. Did you know that in the original version, it wasn't an evil stepmother, it was an evil mother? Can you believe that? Also, there were no dwarves. Interesting. No? Ollie. Definitely no. Madeline. I'm not a princess. Madeline. And I don't need rescuing. Ollie. That's okay. I'm no prince. Madeline. You think I'm pretty? Ollie. For a fairy tale ghost by princess, definitely. Saturday, 8.01 p.m. Ollie. How come you don't log on until after 8? Madeline. I'm usually not alone till then. Ollie. Someone's with you all day? Madeline. Can we please not talk about this? Ollie. Curiouser and curiouser, Madeline Whittier. Sunday, 8.22 p.m. Ollie. Here's a game. Fast five favorites. Book, word, color, vice, person. Ollie. Come on, come on. Type faster, woman. Don't think, just type. Madeline. Sheesh. The Little Prince. Euxorus. Aquamarine. I don't have any vices. My mom. Ollie. Everyone has vices. Madeline. Not me. Why? How many do you have? Ollie. Enough to choose a favorite one. Madeline. Okay, your turn. Ollie. Same list? Madeline. Yes. Ollie. Lord of the Flies. Macrobee. Black. Stealing silverware. My sister. Madeline. Ugh. Lord of the Flies? I don't think we can be friends anymore. That book is awful. Ollie. What's so awful about it? Madeline. Everything? Ollie. You just don't like it because it's true. Madeline. What's true? Left to our own devices, we would kill each other? Ollie. Yes. Madeline. Do you really believe that? Ollie. Yes. Madeline. Well, I don't. I definitely don't. Madeline. Do you really steal silverware? Ollie. You should see my spoon collection. Monday, 8.07 p.m. Ollie. What'd you do to get you so grounded? Madeline, I'm not grounded. I don't want to talk about this. Ollie, does it involve a guy? Ollie, are you knocked up? Do you have a boyfriend? Madeline, oh my God, you're insane. I'm not pregnant and I don't have a boyfriend. What kind of girl do you think I am? Ollie, a mysterious one. Madeline, have you spent all day thinking that I was pregnant? Madeline, have you? Ollie. It crossed my mind once or twice, or fifteen times. Madeline. Unbelievable. Ollie. Don't you want to know if I have a girlfriend? Madeline. No. Tuesday, 8.18 p.m. Madeline. Hi. Ollie. Hey. Madeline. I didn't know if you'd log on tonight. Are you okay? Ollie. Fine. Madeline. What happened? Why was he so angry? Ollie. I don't know what you're talking about. Madeline. Your dad, Ollie. Why was he so angry? Ollie. You got your secrets? I've got mine. Madeline. Okay. Ollie. Okay. Wednesday, 3.31 a.m. Ollie. Couldn't sleep? Madeline. No. Ollie. Me too. Fast five favorites. Movie, food, body part, class. Madeline. That's only four. Besides, it's too late for this. I can't think. Ollie. Waiting. Madeline. 
Pride and Prejudice, the BBC version. Toast, hands, architecture. Ollie, Jesus. Is there a girl on this planet who doesn't love Mr. Darcy? Madeline, all girls love D Mr. Darcy? Ollie, are you kidding? Even my sister loves Darcy and she doesn't love anybody. Madeline, she must love somebody. I'm sure she loves you. Ollie, what's so great about Darcy? Madeline, this is not a serious question. Ollie, he's a snob. Madeline, but he overcomes it and eventually realizes that character matters more than class. He's a man open to learning life's lessons. Also, he's completely gorgeous and noble and dark and brooding and poetic. Did I mention gorgeous? Also, he loves Elizabeth beyond all reason. Ollie, huh? Madeline, yeah. Ollie, my turn? Madeline, proceed. Ollie, Godzilla, toast, eyes, math. Wait, is the body part your favorite on yourself or someone else? Madeline, I don't know, it's your list. Ollie, oh yeah, all right, I'm sticking with eyes. Madeline, what color are your eyes? Ollie, blue. Madeline, be more specific, please. Ollie, Jesus, girls, ocean blue. Madeline, Atlantic or specific? Ollie, Atlantic, what color are yours? Madeline, chocolate brown. Ollie, more specific, please. Madeline, 75% cocoa butter, dark chocolate brown. Ollie, <laughs> nice. Madeline, that was still only four favorites. We need one more. Ollie, I'll leave it to you. Madeline, form of poetry. Ollie, that assumes I have one. Madeline, you're not a heathen. Ollie, limericks. Madeline, you are a heathen. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Ollie, what's wrong with a good limerick? Madeline, good limerick is a contradiction in terms. Ollie, what's your favorite? Madeline, haiku. Ollie, haikus are awful. They're just less fun limericks. Madeline, you've been downgraded from heathen to her heretic. O Ollie, noted. Madeline, okay, I should be asleep. Ollie, okay, me too. Thursday, 8 p.m. Madeline, I wouldn't have guessed that math was your favorite class. Ollie, why not? Madeline, I don't know. You climb buildings and leap over things. Most people are good with their bodies or their minds, but not both. Ollie, is that a nice way of saying you think I'm dumb? Madeline, no. I mean that, I don't know what I mean. Ollie, you mean I'm too sexy to be good at it. That's okay. I get that a lot. Madeline, dot, dot, dot. Ollie, it just takes practice like anything else. I was a mathlete two high schools ago. I'll have you know. Got a probability and stats question? I'm your guy. Madeline, no. Ollie, yes. Madeline, so sexy. Ollie, I sense insecurity. Madeline, no. Ollie, yes. Madeline, so are you going to be a mathlete at SFB High? Ollie, probably not. Ollie, my dad made me quit. He wanted me to do something more manly like football. Madeline, you play football? Ollie, no. He made me quit the mathletes, but he couldn't bully the coach into taking me mid-season. He let it go eventually. Madeline, what if he brings it up again now? Ollie, I'm a little harder to bully now than I was two years ago. Ollie, I'm meaner now, bigger too. Madeline, you don't seem mean. Ollie, you don't know me that well yet. Friday, 3.03 a.m. Madeline, you're awake again? Ollie, yeah. Madeline, I know you don't want to talk about this. Ollie, and yet? Madeline, I saw what happened today. Is your mom okay? Ollie, she's okay. It's not the first time. It's not the last time. Madeline, oh, Ollie. Ollie, please don't owe Ollie me. Ollie, tell me something, anything. Tell me something funny. Madeline, okay. 
Why was the boy surprised to find celery growing out of his ears? Ollie. Why? Madeline. Because he planted corn. Madeline. Hello? Ollie. Oh, Jesus. That is not a good joke. Madeline. Made you smile, though. Ollie. Yeah, it did. Ollie. Thanks. Madeline. Anytime. Saturday, 8.01 p.m. Ollie. I guess I won't get to meet you in person until school starts. Madeline. I don't go to school. Ollie. You mean you don't go to SF Valley High? Where do you go? Madeline. I mean I don't go to regular school. I go online. Ollie. Why? Madeline. I really can't talk about this. Ollie. Come on. You gotta give me something here. Madeline. I want us to be friends. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. Ollie, just tell me. We're still going to be friends. Madeline, I'm sick. Ollie, how sick? Madeline, really sick. Can't leave the house sick. Ollie, Jesus. Ollie, are you dying? Madeline, not right now, no. Ollie, soon? Madeline, if I left the house, yes. Ollie. Okay. Ollie. We're still friends. I don't feel sorry for you. Madeline. Thank you. Ollie. How does the school thing work? Madeline. All my classes are over Skype. I have homework and quizzes and grades. Lots of people are homeschooled. Ollie. Huh. Cool. Ollie. Ever notice how a lot of the National Spelling Bee finalists are all homeschooled? Madeline. I've never noticed that. Ollie. It's a thing. Ollie. I wish we could meet. Madeline. Me too. Madeline. Okay. I need to go now. Ollie. Go then. Ollie. You still there? Madeline. Yes. Ollie. Come to the window. Madeline. Now? I'm wearing my nightgown. Ollie. Put on a robe. Come to the window so that I can see you. Madeline. Okay, I'll be right there. Good night, Ollie. Ollie. Good night, Maddie. Astronaut ice cream. Mr. Waterman's on his way up, Carla says from the doorway. I'm finally putting the finishing touches on my model for architecture class. I've had to cut short two nights of IMs with Ollie to get it done. I don't want my mom to get worried again. The assignment was to design an outdoor shopping dining center in my favorite style. I chose Art Deco because the buildings look like they're flying even though they're standing still. The centerpiece of the complex is a grassy outdoor seating area populated with oversized, oddly shaped chairs painted in bright zigzag patterns. I've already planted miniature plastic palm trees in the grass and now I'm strategically placing miniature plastic people holding miniature plastic shopping bags to give it the vigor of life, as Mr. Waterman would say. In two years of tutoring, I've only met Mr. Waterman in person twice. Usually all of my tutoring includes architecture takes place via Skype. My mom made a special exception this week. I think she's still feeling really bad about Kara and Ollie's visit from a couple of weeks ago. I told her she had nothing to feel bad about but she insisted. Having a visitor is a big deal because they have to agree to a medical background check and a thorough physical. Also, they have to be decontaminated, which is basically like getting a high-speed air bath for about an hour. It's a pain to come see me. Mr. Waterman bustles in looking merry but harried like Santa Claus on Christmas Eve just before the big ride. The decontamination process makes him cold, so he's rubbing his hands together and blowing on them for warmth. Madeline, he says happily, clapping his hands together. He's my favorite of all my tutors. He never looks at me pityingly, and he loves architecture like I love architecture. If I were going to be something when I grow up, an architect is what I would be. Hi, Mr. Waterman, I smile awkwardly, not really knowing how to be around someone who's not Carlo or my mother. So what have we got here? He asks, gray eyes twinkling. I place my last two tiny shoppers next to a toy store and stand back. 
He circles the model, sometimes beaming, sometimes frowning, all the while making weird clucking noises. Well, dear, you've outdone yourself. This is quite lovely. He straightens from the model and is about to pat me on the shoulder before he catches himself. No touching allowed. He shakes his head slightly and then bends over to examine some more. Yes, yes, quite lovely. There are only a few things we should talk about. But first, where's our astronaut hiding? Whenever I make a new model, I make a clay astronaut figure and hide him in it. Each figure is different. This time, he's in full astronaut gear, complete with airtight helmet and bulky oxygen tank, sitting in the diner at a table piled high with food. I've made miniature banana split sundaes, blueberry pancakes, scrambled eggs, toast with butter and marmalade, bacon, milkshakes, strawberry chocolate and vanilla, cheeseburgers and fries. I wanted to make curly fries, but I ran out of time and had to settle for just regular fries. There he is, Mr. Waterman explains. He clucks at the scene for a few moments and then turns to me. His merry eyes are a little less merry than usual. It's just wonderful, my dear, but how will he eat all that scrumptious food with his helmet on? I look back at my astronaut. It never occurred to me that he'd want to eat the food. Everything's a risk. Carla's smiling at me like she knows something I don't know. She's been doing it all day whenever she thinks I'm not looking. Also, she's been singing Take a Chance on Me by ABBA, her absolute favorite band of all time. She's breathtakingly out of tune. I'll have to ask Ollie the probability that she could miss every single note. Shouldn't she hit one just by random chance? It's 12.30 p.m. and I have a half hour for lunch before my history tutor comes online. I'm not hungry. I'm basically never hungry anymore. Apparently, a body can exist on I Am Alone. Carla's not looking, so I tab over to my Gmail. Thirteen messages from Ollie since last night. They're all sent around 3 a.m., and naturally, he doesn't write a subject. I laugh a little and shake my head. I want to read them. I'm dying to read them. But I have to be careful with Carla in the room. I glance over and find her staring back at me, eyebrows raised. Does she know something? What's so interesting on that laptop? She asks. God, she definitely knows. I draw my chair closer to the desk and place my sandwich on the laptop. Nothing. I take a bite of the sandwich. It's Turkey Tuesday. It's not nothing. Something is making you laugh over there. She inches closer, smiling at me. Her brown eyes crinkle at the corners, and her smile reaches the edge of her face. Cat video, I say through a mouthful of turkey. Uh, wrong thing to say. Carla lives for cat videos. She thinks they're the only thing the internet is good for. She comes around, stands behind me, and reaches for the laptop. I drop my sandwich and hug the laptop close to my chest. I'm not a good liar, and I say the first thing that pops into my head. You don't want to see this one, Carla. It's bad. The cat dies. We stare at each other in a kind of shocked standoff for a few seconds. I'm shocked because I'm an idiot, and I can't believe what I just said. Carla's shocked because I'm an idiot, and she can't believe what I just said. Her mouth drops open comically, like a cartoon, and her big round eyes get even bigger and rounder. She bends over at the waist, slaps her knee, and laughs like I've never heard her laugh. Who actually slaps their knee while laughing? You mean to tell me the only thing you could think to say was that it was a dead cat? She's laughing again. So you know? Well... If I didn't know before, I would surely know now. She laughs a little more, slaps her knee again. Oh, you should have seen your face. It's not that funny. I grumble, annoyed that I gave myself away. You forget I have one of you at home. I always know when Rose is up to no good. Besides, you, Miss Thing, are not any good at hiding things. I see you checking your email and looking for him out the window. I put my laptop back up on the desk. So you're not mad at me? I ask, relieved. She hands me my sandwich. It depends. Why are you hiding it from me? I didn't want you to worry about me getting sad again. She eyes me for a long second. Do I need to worry? No. Then I'm not worrying. She brushes my hair back from my shoulders. Eat, she says.
15 minutes later. Maybe he could come for a visit. I've surprised myself by asking, but Carla's not surprised at all. She doesn't even pause from wiping my non-existent dust from my bookshelf. Teenagers are the same all over. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Is that a no? I ask. She laughs at me. Two hours later, I try again. It would only be for a half an hour. He could get decontaminated like Mr. Waterman and then, are you crazy? Ten minutes after that. Fifteen minutes? No. Later still. Please, Carla. She cuts me off. And here I thought you were doing fine. I am. I am doing fine. I just want to meet him. We can always get what we want, she says. From the flatness of her tone alone, I know it's a phrase she uses on Rosa all the time. I can tell she regrets saying it to me, but still she doesn't say anything else. She's leaving for the day, halfway out my bedroom door when she stops. You know, I don't like saying no to you. You're a good girl. I rush right through this opening. He'd get decontaminated and sit across the room, far, far away from me, and, and only for 15 minutes, 13 minutes at the most. She shakes her head, but it's not a firm shake. It's too risky, and your mother would never allow it. We won't tell her, I say instantly. She gives me a sharp, dis disappointed look. Do you girls really find it so easy to lie to your mamas? To those who wait. Carla doesn't say anything about it again until just after lunch two days later. Now. No touching. You stay on your side of the room and he stays on his. I already told him the same thing. I understand the word she's saying, but I don't understand what she's saying. What do you mean? You mean he's here? He's he already here? You stay on your side and he stays on his. No touching. You understand? I didn't, but I nod yes anyway. He's waiting for you in the sunroom. Decontaminated? The look on her face says, what do you take me for? I stand up, sit down, and stand up again. Oh, Lordy, she says. Go fix yourself up fast. I'm only giving you 20 minutes. My stomach doesn't just flip. It is a high-wire somersault without a net. What made you change your mind? She comes over, takes my chin in her hand, and stares into my eyes for such a long time that I start to fidget. I can see her sorting through all she wants to say. In the end, all she says is, You deserve a little something. This is how Rosa gets everything she wants. She simply asks for it from her mother with a two-big heart. I head to the mirror to fix myself. I've almost forgotten what I look like. I don't spend a lot of time looking. There's no need when there's no one else to see you. I like to think that I'm an exactly 50-50 mixture of my mom and dad. My warm brown skin is what you get by mixing her pale olive skin with his richer dark brown. My hair is big and long and wavy. Not as curly as his, but not as straight as hers. Even my eyes are a perfect blend neither Asian nor African, but somewhere in between. I look away and then look back quickly, trying to catch myself, unawares to get more accurate picture, trying to see what Ollie will see. I try out a laugh and then a smile, with teeth and without. I even try out a frown, though I'm hoping I won't have to use it. Carla watches my antics in the mirror, amused and bemused at the same time. I almost remember when I was your age she says. I don't turn around, talking instead to the Carla in the mirror. Are you sure about this? You don't think it's too risky anymore? You're trying to talk me out of it? She comes over and puts a hand on my shoulder. Everything's a risk. Not doing anything is a risk. It's up to you. I look around my white room and my white couch and shelves, my white walls, all of it safe and familiar and unchanging. I think of Ollie, decontamination cold and waiting for me. He's the opposite of all these things. He's not safe. He's not familiar. He's in constant motion. He's the biggest risk I've ever taken. 
Future Perfect from Madeline F. Whittier to generic user 033 at gmail.com. Subject Future Perfect sent July 10th, 1230 p.m. By the time you read this, we will have met. It will have been perfect. Ollie. The sunroom is my favorite room in the house. It's almost all glass, glass roof and floor-to-ceiling glass windows that look out onto our perfectly manicured back lawn. The room's decor is like a movie set of a tropical rainforest. It's filled with realistic and lush-looking fake tropical plants, banana and coconut trees laden with fake fruit and hibiscus plants that have fake flowers. There's even a babbling stream that snakes its way through the room, but there are no fish. At least no real ones. The furniture is aged white wicker that looks like it's been sitting in the sun. Because it's meant to be tropical, my mom keeps a heated fan running and a slightly too warm breeze fills the room. Most days I love it because I can imagine that the glass has fallen away and I'm outside. Other days I feel like a fish in an aquarium. By the time I get there, Ollie has managed to climb halfway up the rocky wall. Hands and feet wedged into crevices. He's pinching one of the large banana leaves between his fingers when I walk in. It's not real, he says to me. It's not real, I say at the same time. He lets go of the branch but remains where he is on the wall. Climbing for him is like walking for the rest of us. Are you going to stay up there? I ask, because I don't know what else to say. I'm thinking about it, Maddie. Carla said I had to stay as far away from you as possible, and she doesn't seem like the kind of lady that you piss off. You can come down, I say. Carla's not as scary as she seems. Okay. He slips effortlessly to the floor. He puts his hands into his back pockets, crosses his feet at the ankles, and leans back against the wall. I don't think I've ever seen him so still. I think he's trying not to spook me. Maybe you should come in, he says, and then I realize that I'm still in the doorway holding on to the knob. I close the door, but don't take my eyes off of him. His eyes track my movements as well. After all the I am's, I felt like I knew him, but now with him standing in front of me, it doesn't feel that way at all. He's taller than I thought, and way more muscled, but not bulky. His arms are lean and sculpted, and his biceps fill the sleeves of his black t-shirt. His skin is a tan golden brown. It would be warm to touch. You're different than I thought you'd be, I blurt out. He grins and a dimple forms just under his right eye. I know. Sexier, right? It's okay. You can say it. I goff. How do you manage to carry around an ego that size and weight? It's the muscles. He shoots back, flexing his biceps and raising a single comical eyebrow. Some of my nervousness falls away, but then comes right back when he watches me laugh without saying anything for a few seconds too long. Your hair really is so long, he says. And you never said you had freckles. Was I supposed to? Freckles might be the deal breaker. He smiles and the dimple comes back. Cute. I move to the couch and sit. He leans against the rock wall across the room. They're the bane of my existence, I say referring to the freckles. This is a ridiculous thing to say because, of course, the bane of my existence is that I'm sick and unable to leave my house. We both realize this at the same time, and then we're both laughing again. You're funny, he says after our laughter subsides. I smile. I've never thought of myself as a funny girl, but I'm happy that he thinks so. We are awkward together for a few moments, unsure of what to say. The silence would be much less noticeable over I am. We could chalk it up to any number of distractions. But right now, in real life, it feels like we both have blank thought balloons over our heads. Actually, mine's not blank at all, but I really can't tell him how beautiful his eyes are. They're Atlantic Ocean blue, just like he'd said. It's strange, because of course, I'd known that. But the difference between knowing it and seeing them in person is the difference between dreaming of flying and flight. This is a crazy room, he says looking around. Yeah, my mom built it so I could feel like I was outside. Does it work? Mm, most days. I have a really excellent imagination. You really are a fairy tale. Princess Madeline and the Glass Castle. He's quiet again, like he's trying to build up to something. 
It's okay to ask me, I say. He's wearing a single black rubber band around his wrist, and he pulls at it a few times before continuing. How long have you been sick? My whole life. What would happen if you went outside? My head would explode, or my lungs, or my heart. How can you joke? I shrug. How can I not? Besides, I try not to want things I can't have. You're like a Zen master. You should teach a class. It takes a long time to learn. I smile back at him. He crouches and then sits, back against the wall, forearms on his knees. Even though he's still, I can feel the need to move coming off of him. The boy is kinetic energy. Where do you want to go to the most? He asks. Besides outer space? Yes, Maddie. Besides outer space. I like the way he says Maddie, as if he's been calling me that my whole life. The beach? The ocean? Want me to describe it for you? I nod more vigorously than I expected to. My heart speeds up like I'm doing something illicit. I've seen pictures and videos, but what's it like to actually be in the water? Is it like taking a bath in a giant tub? Sort of, he says, slowly, considering. No, I take it back. Taking a bath is relaxing. Being in the ocean is scary. It's wet and cold and salty and deadly. That's not what I was expecting. You hate the ocean? He's grinning now, warming to his topic. I don't hate it. I respect it. He holds up a single finger. Respect. It's Mother Nature at its finest. Awesome, beautiful, impersonal, murderous. Think about it. All that water and you could still die of thirst. And the whole point of waves is to suck your feet from under you so that you drown faster. The ocean will swallow you whole and burp you out and not notice you were even there. Oh my god, you're scared of it! We haven't even gotten to the great white sharks or saltwater crocodiles or Indonesian needlefish or okay, okay, I say laughing and holding up my hands for him to stop. It's no joke, he says with mock seriousness. The ocean will kill you, he winks at me. It turns out that Mother Nature is a lousy mom. I'm too busy laughing to say anything. So what else do you want to know? After that, nothing. Come on, I'm a fount of knowledge. Okay, do one of your crazy tricks for me. He's on his feet in the blink and begins assessing the room critically. There's not enough room. Let's go out. He stops himself mid-sentence. Crap, Maddie, I'm sorry. Stop, I say. I stand up and hold out a hand. Do not feel sorry for me. I say this harshly, but it's too important of a point. I couldn't stand pity coming from him. He flicks his rubber band, nod once, and lets it go. I can do a one-art handstand. He steps away from the wall and simply falls forward until he's upside down on his hands. It's such a graceful and effortless movement that I'm momentarily filled with envy. What's it like to have such complete confidence in your body and what it will do? That's amazing, I whisper. We're not in church, he whispers, shouts back, a voice slightly strained from being upside down. I don't know, I say. It feels like I should be quiet. He doesn't answer. Instead, he closes his eyes, slowly removes his left hand from the floor, and holds it out to the side. He's almost perfectly still. The quiet bobbling of the pond and his slightly heavier breathing are the only sounds in the room. His t-shirt falls up and I can see the hard muscles of his stomach. The skin is the same warm golden tan. I pull my eyes away. Okay, I say, you can stop now. He's upright again before I can blink. What else can you do? He rubs his hands together and grins back at me. One backflip later, he sits back down against the wall and closes his eyes. So why outer space first? He asks. I shrug. I want to see the world, I guess. Not what most people meant by that, he says, smiling. I nod and close my eyes as well. Do you ever feel... I begin. But then the door opens and Carla bustles in to rush him out. You didn't touch, right? She asks, arm, akimbo. We both open our eyes and stare at each other. All at once, I'm hyper aware of his body and mine. There was no touching, Ollie confirms. 
his eyes never leaving my face. Something in his tone makes me blush hard, and he travels a slow wave across my face and chest. Spontaneous combustion is a real thing. I'm certain of it.